This is a presentation um, entitled Delivering on Specifications. should actually probably be closer to delivering on uh, requirements because it actually took us some effort to get to specification. Um, so brief introductions. Uh, so I work with uh, a nice group of folks called Consensus. And uh, we're mostly Drupal 8 uh, uh, developers and uh, programmers and uh, sysadmins who specialize in a gear. So those of you who aren't familiar with it, it's a Drupal uh, hosting system um, that's been around for like 10 years. But it's a nice stable system. We're going to look at it very briefly. Um, if you have any questions about it afterwards, feel free to uh, track us down. And we focus on social enterprises, nonprofits, and the public sector. So we work a lot with uh, various groups. Um, uh, Health Canada being sort of one of our big ones now. We've worked with different um, international NGOs and so forth. Uh, we're actually, a, a lot of these kind of predate consensus. We merged a bunch of our uh, individual um, consultancies to form consensus. Uh, so some of these do predate the, the, the company itself. Um, that said, what I want to look at today is sort of our general agile approach. I'm going to like run through this stuff fairly quickly because most of it's probably fairly familiar. Um, and then get into a particularly demanding project uh, and look at that in a little bit more depth to show the challenges that we were facing in terms of actually being able to, why we needed to prove that we had delivered these specifications and how we needed to do it in a particular way that um, satisfied the requirements in this particular case. And we'll look at the solutions and some of the tools and um, I want to leave enough time at the end that we can circle back and touch on any of the other topics. Uh, if there's, if you're interested in seeing more about it. So, <coughs> Agile has been around for a long time. Um, if we just look at the happy path that we have here, um, we're going to see stuff that should be pretty familiar. Um, try to focus on, on business value. That's actually one of the things that was kind of challenging in this particular project. Um, and then uh, our development process really is intended to um, both build up the capacity within the organization that we're going to deliver this solution to and make sure that it's something that they'll be able to maintain in the long run. So a lot of that involves both training, coaching, and uh, documentation that's going to be sufficient to allow them to, um, to take ownership of it and manage it from that point forward. So um, generally what we want to do is we want to def uh, analyze the requirements and uh, come up with something along the lines of user stories, right? This should be familiar. As a role, I want to do a task in order to accomplish something, right? And so what this does is generally gives you um, the context that you need to understand what you're trying to do when you're implementing a feature. If people just describe a feature as, I need X field, it isn't necessarily clear that that field type, what field type it ought to be, or uh, how to do the document, the inline documentation to be informative to the audience that's actually gonna be using it. And so that this format is really helpful when we, um, uh, when we look at requirements. And so uh, you're, we're going to see this a little bit later on, come back um, a little later. We then take those requirements as defined, and you'll see that at the top of this, we have that in order to realize the main business value as an actor in the system, uh, I want to gain some beneficial outcome. Right? That's sort of the general gist of it. Uh, this is using Behat, uh, which implements a uh, a domain specific language referred to as Gherkin generally um, that allows you to describe in human language the behavior the system is meant to, um, to exhibit. So it's a form of automated testing that is very close to the end user and is really helpful when you're working with end users because it's something they can comprehend. There's no code involved. Um, it's not talking about classes and methods and uh, assert that or anything of that nature. Uh, it really is in, in human language. It can be translated uh, fairly easily, and it can be extended to be um, more specific to the domain that you're looking for, right? So um, if you do a lot of JavaScript-y stuff, then you can create some of these things that might target specific behaviors in JavaScript, for example. Um, there's, uh, it, it can also be extended fairly easily with things like X queries. So if you have a button, for example, that you want somebody to press, but in the framework that you have, it doesn't have a label or a title or the things that are natively supported by, uh, by the extensions. You can target things more specifically. Now, you generally don't want to do that, but it does give you the flexibility to work with whatever you're, you're kind of handed, especially if there's legacy code bases where you don't necessarily control all of the components that you're, you're trying to 
workload for. So this is what we try to target in terms of um, the specification. So we'll sit down and work through what do they actually want the system to exhibit in terms of behavior. We also like this because if we want to change the implementation behind it, like say moving from a Drupal 7 to Drupal 8, if they have an existing system, we can wrap this kind of testing around the behavior of the existing system and it simplifies it, it rebuilding that in Drupal 8. And then if we alter the behavior in Drupal 8, it's in human language that we can put in front of a project manager, or business analyst, uh, whoever it is, decision maker, and say, this is how the process has changed, and they'll understand it. Right? Now, it goes into a lot of detail um, at this level usually, but it's worthwhile to go into that sort of thing. So uh, Agile, this should be familiar for everybody, right? So in those specifications, we end up with a backlog, which is just a long list of all the features we want to implement. And then we start taking chunks of those, the highest priority ones, and we work on them for one to three weeks generally. And um, we then do a daily stand-up to just keep on board of what we're doing, right? Keep everybody aware. So we had a couple of people working on this project, myself, one of my colleagues, and then some internal resources. And so we would just regularly touch base. What have I done since we last talked? What am I gonna do be between now and the next time we're gonna talk? and what challenges am I facing, or what am I blocked with, and who can help me out with that, right? Um, and then the output is uh, ideally a functional release, some functionality that within the one to three week time frame, uh, you come out with something that can be used, right? And uh, then you just start that process over until you've run out of things that are high enough value for, them, for the client to continue to work, uh, to, to pay for, essentially. The way that you generally um, operate within a given um, iteration is you have some number of uh, tickets or, or uh, tasks that you want to accomplish. You set that at the beginning and then you keep that fixed throughout that time frame so that your priorities aren't shifting within a given time frame and you're not like doing a lot of context switching or um, you know putting something in cold storage and then having to come back to it three weeks later and figure out what your thought process was. And so one of the ways we do that is with burn down charts so that you know we've got a date three weeks hence and we've got 15 things we need to do and so we should be accomplishing five of those per week on average, right? And that guideline is kind of the ideal, you know, you're never actually going to achieve it and it's very com uh, common that you see that hump that's over top of it because a lot of times while you're working on a feature you're not able to close off that ticket but then a bunch of things kind of come together and then it's a fairly steep um, curve towards the end, right? To come to, to get things uh, finished up. Prioritizing things was something that we just kind of covered briefly, right? Like that we should be working on the highest priority items that we can finish within a given sprint. Um, a lot of times people have a hard time prioritizing. Everything seems important, everything seems urgent, and it's hard to kind of differentiate. And so this is a useful tool um, because priority is not something that happens on its own. It's not a, it's not standalone. It's always only ever relative between different items. And so this is a useful thing to put up. It's called the Eisenhower matrix for uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower, the former president. Um, and you can put this up on say a whiteboard with sticky notes and you write up your, your various features that you're looking at and you can position them on here relative to one another, right? And then if you space it out after you've put them, put them there, you'll see where things stand relative to one another and the things that are both important and urgent are obviously the things that actually should float to the top. And then you can kind of go through um, and, and put them in generally this order because a, a backlog tends to be one dimensional, right? Like it's just got high priority, low priority, right? It's not, there's not any more flexibility generally that you have um, once it's in that order. So this is a useful tool for that. And then uh, this is just a general maxim of uh, project management that you've got three variables and you can only ever control two of them, right? It doesn't, it, you, can, you can control any two of the three, but at the end of the day, something's gonna slip if, you, if one of them is going out of whack, right? So you've got your cost, your schedule, and your scope. If you run out of money, you're gonna have to either uh, do it slower, maybe wait until you've got more money, or you're gonna to have to reduce the scope because you're just not gonna be able to accomplish as much, et cetera, right? Alternatively, if you try to keep all the rest of them in line, you're going to, the quality is what's gonna suffer, right? 
And so that's basically um, another thing that's useful to make sure that your clients understand or the organization understands because there's no simple trade-offs for this kind of stuff. So <clears throat> the project in particular that I want to touch on is one that uh, is ongoing, but the majority of it has been built and is, uh, has been successfully launched um, earlier in the year. And it was a community of practice for the settlement sector. Now, a community of practice, uh, probably everybody's familiar with Drupal.org. That's actually a really good example of a community of practice. It's a bunch of people who share um, a skill set and a, a passion that come together to share that, um, that knowledge, to look for knowledge in a, in a particular place. Um, and uh, it, it has to do with like a practical methods for accomplishing what you're trying to do. In this case, we were doing this for the settlement sector. The settlement sector, for those of you that aren't familiar with it, is uh, basically about 500 agencies spread across uh, the, the country that help to settle newcomers to the country. So immigrants and refugees and so forth, helping them to get their kids registered for school or um, letting people know from warm countries that, well, you have to dress properly in the winter because you'll die, right? Like, I mean, this is something that's foreign to a lot of people. And there's these agencies that are generally nonprofits that are kind of spread out all over the place that do this. Um, they there's, those are independent NGOs that are largely financed by IRCC, which is the government agency behind it. But they don't, uh, they have some reporting, but they're really independently managed. So there's not a lot of sort of hierarchy there. There's, they're spread out, and there's a lot of people who are in their late 50s, early 60s looking to retire. And the idea behind the settlement sector of COP here was for them to be able to share their knowledge and wisdom with the new generations that are coming in so that they wouldn't lose this knowledge uh, base and experience base um, as people started to retire, the, the baby boom of generation and stuff that had kind of um, built it up over, uh, you know, in the 70s and 80s and into the 90s. So this is what they thought they needed in terms of services. And so when we were looking at the RFP for this, um, we were like, yeah, we can do all of those things. That's not a problem, right? We have the skill set. We've been doing this stuff for a long time. We're all fairly senior. We can pick up and do all of these things. However, there were some obvious challenges, and these should probably not be unfamiliar to anybody who's ever worked in this kind of thing from either side. We had a short, firm time frame. Now, the funding, and I'll go into this a little bit more in a little bit, um, was coming from IRCC, and anything that's government funded has this, like, a certain amount has to be paid by the end of March. That's the fiscal year end for, um, for the government of Canada. And that was one of the things that there's just a drop dead date. If we couldn't show something at that date, they weren't going to get funding for the next year and the whole program would fall apart. So there wasn't anything we could do to alter the, um, the, the time frame. Unfortunately, the requirements, and we're going to get into this a little bit more too, were very vague. And I'll explain why they were vague, but um, that was just a reality we had to face. They weren't really in the, say, requirements format that we were talking about or anything that was even really all that useful in a lot of ways. And the other thing was, because this was being funded externally, there was a fixed budget. We couldn't go back to the trough and say, let's, you know, can we get more for, for, for this work? At least not within the budget year, right? And that was part of the negotiation that we ended up talking through with them about how to straddle the budget years and, and figure out ways to uh, shift things between line items and so forth. So we figured, short time frame, no problem. We're all experienced. We're, we're used to working under, under pressure. We can handle that. Big requirements, we figured, well, we'll just work it out as we go along. We've got some plans. We've done this kind of thing before. We've worked through with people how to uh, get more specific about their requirements so that it's easier for us to understand what it is that they actually want us to be built. The fixed budget, well, we, we'd been talking with them about it. We figured we could, we could work around it. Um, you know, we understood what the budget was and how, you know, what we could accomplish within it. Um, and so that's, we, we decided to go forward with it. Bear in mind that we were, uh, this is our first project as a company. We were like one month old. We were like, you know what, we've got some big things down the road that we know are coming, but it could be six months. So let's pick up this project and run with it and see what we could do. Um, and so we, we went forward with it despite all of these kind of warning signs uh, being in place. So one of the ways we tried to accomplish this uh, was uh, in the time frame, we were looking for uh, a way to accelerate what we were doing. So get to a point where we could then start iterating on it a little bit faster. And one of the things we looked at was Drupal distributions to get a set of functionality um, in place pretty much right away and then be able to build on that and have something that we could put in front of clients um, and uh, start 
getting feedback from them and so forth. And that'll come back as a theme a little bit later. Here's an example of some of the specs. We had about uh, eight pages like this. And uh, just to read off a couple, uh, the COP will provide a platform th for the settlement sector. That's not particularly helpful, right? Like it's just, it's a platform, okay. Um, we've got some stuff about a platform for peer-to-peer -peer connection and communication. Okay, so it's gonna need some kind of social functionality, messaging. We didn't really know exactly what they wanted. They couldn't elaborate on it. Um, it'll be a platform for network learning and a platform for learning circles. And we weren't really sure what that really meant, like what the difference was between these things and how to, how to implement something that did this. So when we, when we started looking through this, we were like, okay, this is gonna be a bit of a problem. Um, but we think we have a solution. We'll do a discovery phase. And this is something we've done in the past. We sit down with clients and we work through getting more specific, right? So we, we try to understand their specific domain and then we put it into the requirements format that we have, right? And then they can say, yes, that's what we want the system to do, right? And then that gives us clear guidance about what we want to build or what we need to build. Except they didn't think that they could do that. The reason being that they felt that the requirements they had, which they had spent roughly 18 months building, should be sufficient. And because they had spent 18 months out of a three-year project getting to that point, they didn't want to go back to square one and said, no, you just have to start building it right away because we have to deliver something in six months from now, right? And in fact, they had to deliver something three months before that. So three months from when we were talking with them, they needed to deliver something that was this launch phase. So if I go back here, they've got this beta pilot MVP and then this launch. Now, initially what they wanted to do was build the pilot in WordPress and then re-implement it, so build a pilot in WordPress in three months, and then re-implement that in Drupal in three months later, right? So we, we convinced them not to do that. Um, but we weren't able to get them to come up with, to, to actually go through the discovery phase with us, right? So um, considering we had a fixed budget, really all we could do is kind of max it out. We, we, were, we were very open with them, they were open with us about what, their, what they had available and what their constraints were. Bear in mind, the budget they were getting also involved hiring people to like animate the community, to translate content. There was a bunch of things that went into this, only a relatively small sliver, in my opinion, far too small of a sliver considering it's a technology platform, was going to the development phase. As a result, we essentially had to provide a fixed bid because they needed to have some predictability that it wasn't gonna be an open-ended budget. They didn't have the money for it. So we were facing a situation where we had a fixed bid and vague specs. And so the solution that we came up with, which was suboptimal and risky for us, was in our presentation, in our, our proposal, we actually built up a complete mock-up of the system, right? Now this was just screenshots and stuff. I'll show an example of it. And in this document, which ended up being about 80 pages long, so this was, this was one, this was made up about two thirds of our proposal. <clears throat> I started out by basically just taking all of the requirements as they had them and tried to figure out what we could do to make that happen. And uh, one of the things um, that we'll see in a little bit as well is that we said, okay, they need a community of practice. They don't really know what that means. We don't have any particular experience building a community of practice. We've participated in them. Um, and so we went with uh, the idea of, well, let's look at an existing community of practice and essentially just clone that, right? And by cloning that, we didn't have to think through what are the proper ways of doing this. We could just say, this is best practices, let's implement that, and then let's look afterwards at where the gaps are between what this could do and what might be specific to the settlement sector, right? And so based on that, we were able to, to mock up all the different components and how piece, you know, components would fit together. And then in the proposal, we also then referenced the codes for the different, uh, different components as we went through to, sh to illustrate that this, um, this behavior ought to satisfy this requirement, right? And we just basically went through all the requirements and then highlighted the ones that just didn't have a technical aspect to it. But anyway, the requirements, coming back to that, <clears throat> part of the reason that they were so vague was that they were developed by a committee. Um, and we're, we'll, we'll look at that in a minute as well. But this is a large committee made up of representatives from these agencies um, in each province. Right? So, um, I don't know if you've ever tried to work with a large committee and come to some conclusion when you have a blue skies initiative, right? Where it's like, what are you looking for? 
is a really hard decision to, for, for, to make as a committee, right? And so that's why they had all of these things that there was a lot of overlap, there was a lot of vagueness, because they didn't really know what, what that looked like. Because this was coming from government, there was a third party evaluator that would come in and look at the, the requirements they had provided us or the, the, um, and uh, evaluate whether the system was delivering those requirements, right? And this was a third party person who um, was part of that committee, uh, but was not somebody that was going to be engaged on a day-to-day -day basis with us in terms of like trying to elucidate, elucidate what these uh, requirements were. And then to make matters worse, um, there were three previous settlement sector COP initiatives that had been tried over the last 20 years, all of which had failed. Okay. And I say three plus because one of them was like a wiki, and it was like you know there was an attempt to do something social around it, but it didn't work. And so there was a lot of trepidation on the part of the sector um, participants and stakeholders because this thing had been tried before and had not succeeded. And so that's why so much of the project budget was dedicated to people animating the community and doing translation and content and stuff, as opposed to just looking at it from a technical standpoint. So the design by committee problem is one where if you don't give them something specific to, make, to, to comment on, conversations can go all over the place. And so what we wanted to do is provide them a quick prototype that we could then put in front of them and say, does this, how does this feel to you as far as the community aspects, the communications aspects? Do we, do we need to focus on the one-to-one -one messaging or is it more conversations around topics and that sort of thing? So <clears throat> that was one of the approaches we took. The third party evaluation, we didn't know what that was gonna look like initially. So we kind of just figured, all right, well, well, we'll tackle that when we get to it. Um, and we'll see how we did that later on. And we actually kind of blew the guy away. He was really happy with what we, what we provided. And uh, so this is kind of why things ended up the way they were. Now it's reasonable, in my opinion, that they ended up the way they were. Like it's foreseeable even, um, but it's just kind of unfortunate that it's significantly suboptimal. So the federal government was the uh, agency, IRCC was the one funding this. But they knew that it couldn't be a top-down thing. They were not going to be in a position to dictate to 500 independent agencies, you must use this new system that we put in place. And so what they did was, they formed this National Advisory Council, which kind of built up from, it was sort of a grassroots thing. In each province, the leading organizations would send representatives. And those were the guys that came up with those, those specifications, right? That was that big council. They understood that they wouldn't be able to be regularly active in the project. They wouldn't, they, they wouldn't be, uh, these were all like the executive directors of these organizations, right? Or deputy executive directors in some cases. And so they weren't gonna have a day-to-day -day engagement in the project. That was just not going to be uh, something that they could, they could provide. So they formed a project management team where they had a couple of designated people from those, some of those leading organizations that would participate more regularly and sort of try to funnel information back and forth and so forth. And then there was the operations team who were uh, the people who were either providing content, doing translation, working with us on the design aspects. In fact, we have a couple of members here, or at least one. Miyuki here uh, is one of the uh, themers that, that came onto the project. And so if we looked at who we had access to, there was no opportunity for us ever to speak to the IRCC. That was just off limits. In fact, almost nobody was ever speaking to them directly. They had a representative at the National Advisory Council. Well, we didn't really have access to them either, certainly not directly. We had access to a couple of members, mostly ones that were in the project management team, plus that external evaluator, but we only had access to him once, so that was unfortunate. The project management team themselves were incredibly busy just working the politics of all of this, right? Um, it took about six months, for example, to come up with a logo design. This is a, you know, and then the logo design was central to a lot of the theming. So there was, there was these extended delays on some of these things, and the project management team had their hands full doing, um, just trying to wrangle that, right? And so essentially we ended up having uh, the operations team that we could work with on a regular day-to-day -day basis, and unfortunately, they're not empowered to make changes to the bigger picture policy of how this thing is, putting to, is being put together. So uh, this is not uncommon, and actually, from what I understand, this was our first project that had this particular structure where it was federal funding that was going through a nonprofit that was then being contracted out to us in this case. Um, but having spoken to other people, it seems that this is actually a very common way that these things are structured. And so the challenges we faced 
are not uncommon. They were, however, new to us that it was this far um, down the road of, of like trying to wrangle a lot of a lot of things. Heard heard a bunch of cats. So here's some of the tools that we used, and I'm just going to go through sort of how they fit into this context, right? So I, I, I mentioned um, most of these are probably familiar to those of you who've been working in the Drupal community for a while, um, and I'm just going to go through them and show sort of how they fit in. So Open Social is a uh, Drupal distribution with social features. Okay, so we didn't want to have to figure out how to implement something like following a user or following a piece of content. Open Social provided all of that out of the box. And so we were able to take that and just build on it from there. There's also the concept of groups, private and public groups, things of that nature. That was stuff that we figured we would need in implementing what we were looking for. And so this gave us something that we could also spin up within a matter of days and start putting in front of people and saying, hey, look, this is what, it's, what the baseline is. We're going to iterate on this. Right? And so that gave them a uh, significant sense that this wasn't going to be just a you know, crash and burn failure as some of the previous settlement sector projects had been. At the very least, they had something that was a social platform right out of the, out of the gate. Right? We then were using Bayhat. Now, Bayhat is the behavior-driven testing framework. Um, so that was all the part about you know, when I am on the front page uh, and I click login, I should see a username field and I should see a password field. Right? It's that sort of framework. And so this is the, what it works out to be. We built that into our CI system. And so every time we pushed a commit up to our GitLab instance, um, it would run all these tests. And you know, that just grew as we added more and more functionality. And we were able to confirm that um, obviously, big complex systems like this, when you make a change in one place and have unintended side effects elsewhere, this allowed us to confirm that we weren't breaking anything as we were moving along. And we needed to move at a fairly quick pace. And so having to go back and manually retest things was just not, not in the cards. So this was a great way for us to, to do that. Um, now, we had worked with all of these tools previously. So we were able to just kind of copy paste a bunch of stuff in. Um, it's a little bit harder sometimes to get started on it, and if you're not familiar with it, but it's worthwhile spending the time to do so. We used Lando as a local development toolkit. This was the first time we'd used Lando for this. Um, we are uh, sort of Agar experts, so we do a lot of stuff with uh, hosting environments with Agar, and then we run that largely in like local VMs, and it gives us the ability to do things like clone a site and then you know, mess around with it and, and do things like that. In this case, we wanted to try something uh, uh, a little bit more, um, a little bit more flexible for the use cases that we were going to be looking at, and automating some of the, the the build stages, and also being able to put this in the hands of that operations team so that they could build it themselves and run it themselves. And we didn't feel that we needed to give them like a course in how to operate Azure, which is really a like a production grade hosting system, in order for them to do some theme development and so forth. So that's kind of where Lando came into play. Um, we'd been working, uh, we, we knew Mike Pirog and some of these guys who, who developed it over the, over the years and previous generations of it, so we had some fair confidence that it was going to help us do what we wanted to do, uh, and it did. And so basically it just builds a bunch of Docker containers, uh, one for the database, one for the web app, and you know, would, would run it um, and we'd be able to, to just use it for that. It also has some nice features in terms of uh, having like a router that'll uh, render a domain for you and stuff like that, so you don't have to go and hack your Etsy host file and things like that. We did use Agar. We used Agar for the hosting system, right? So this was um, everything from staging through production, at the very least, uh, we, would put on, we would put on here. We actually had testing as well, um, because a lot of users were not going to be running a local version, right? And so we would regularly, for every release, build a test system. They would go in, validate some of the, the, that the features had been implemented properly or the bugs had been fixed. And then we would merge that into the, the, the mainline branch. And we had an ongoing rolling uh, beta site uh, as well. So we had a beta site that was like the current, um, uh, the current release. And then we had a testing site that was the, uh, the upcoming release. Right? So that was how we, how we ran that. And Eager provided everything we needed for that. I have lost focus here. There we go. Um, this is what Agar looks like. Uh, it gives you a lot of flexibility around um, managing your sites. It's got a lot of best practices built into it. It does things like, for example, alert us when there's security updates that are required on the site and so forth. So since we did have a production end uh, endpoint to this workflow, um, this provided a, a ton of flexibility around that. 
And there's a lot of uh, Git-based stuff that's been built into it over the past few years, Composer and so forth, um, that allows us to very quickly and easily build up uh, new platforms, which is just a, that's uh, eager speak for code base, and then install multiple sites on that, whether it be our testing or beta sites, and then be able to you know, upgrade our sites between them and so forth. Obviously, we used Git. I'm not going to go into Git very much. Uh, this was important because we were using feature branches, since there were multiple of us working on disparate parts of the system at once. We didn't want to be stepping on each other's toes, and so we used Git for that. Uh, we also, within the system, uh, Open Social is built on features, uh, capital F features. And so we use that to a large extent to export our config. Um, that is not the best practice anymore, and we've run into some of the challenges uh, with that, especially around like config translation and sort of weird edge cases um, that uh, we, we ran into with this stuff. Uh, there are better tools now for that part of it, so I think config actions is one of the sort of the new hotness on that one. Um, but anyway, Git was used uh, extensively, obviously, with uh, feature branches and merges and all that stuff. We used GitLab um, mostly for issue tracking and Kanban boards. We had we did some merge request stuff, but since it was just two of us, we could coordinate that fairly easily, and there wasn't really a need too much for uh, going into a lot of depth there. Um, that said, the Kanban boards, so this is what it actually looked like for us, right? Now, in that initial one, you have sort of a nice straight line going down, and then your, your actuality kind of like tracked it a little bit. Um, what we saw in, in reviewing some of this stuff was that we started out with, like in this case, four issues, right? Those four issues were those vague requirements kind of things. And it was actually like 18 different things that were in those. And so what happened was initially we started out with those and then we broke them out into separate tickets, right? And then we worked those. So uh, as we went along, it got a little better, still had things that we needed to break out but it's starting to look a little, uh, a little bit more like a coherent line. And then this happened. Now, what happened here is that we implemented a gate system where we would put things into a, a sta status, instead of just closing it, um, where it was for review. And uh, they just got stuck there. This was just a process thing. The project management team wasn't able to, to proactively go through that uh, on a regular basis. And so we were completing tasks and then they were just piling up in this queue and not being closed. And then eventually we just said, well, this is kind of ridiculous. We need to sit down with you for a day and just go through all of these things. And that's when it just dropped. Right? We just closed everything because we were able to demonstrate that it worked. Um, and then finally, towards the end of the, like the, the, the latter part of the initial phase of the build, um, it started to look like a regular Kanban board, right? like, or not board, but a burn down chart where we had, at that point, we understood the number of, like, that we had the level of granularity in the tickets, and we were able to just work through it and, and get it all done. So from a documentation standpoint, uh, I am a huge fan of Hugo, and I would highly recommend that you take a look at it if you haven't already. It's a static site generator. And so what it allows us to do is put a docs directory into the, um, into the code base, right next to the actual code that's running, and have all of our operations docs in there, for example. How do you deploy a new code base? How do you upgrade the site? How do you revert features? How do you theme things? All those kind of things that we wanted to be able to hand off to the client about how to operate this big complex system, um, we put in the code itself so that when we were looking at closing a ticket that implemented some new feature, if there was documentation required, we would, we would look to see if the documentation had been updated before we would merge that branch, right? So Hugo is great for that, and this is where I'm going to start looking at this a little bit more in, uh, with a demo. I'm gonna, so this is uh, also how we managed those requirements, and in turn, how we were able to show that the requirements were satisfied. Okay, so Hugo was a, a big part of that. And so we took the requirements that were in a Word doc, right, and we essentially moved them into, uh, into Hugo. Now, let me just show you how Hugo's written. It's actually just Markdown. And, uh, well, here, let me show you the raw version of this. Bear with me. Uh, maybe I can make it a little bigger. Okay. So it's Markdown. And in this case, it's building out a table. And then we have these, uh, what are called short codes. And these are custom short codes. Sorry. These are custom short codes that would basically just translate this requirement code into, for example, a link to something else. And so 
Um, I'll go back to this to illustrate how that worked. So one of the first things we did was we made it so that each of these things were an anchor, right? Fairly straightforward, but it allowed us to go back through the GitLab ticket, and every time there was one of these codes, we would point it to this anchor, right, for, for that particular code. And that allowed us to cross-reference the issues we were working on with the requirements document. We then did the reverse. We put a link to the issues that we were working on that were tagged with that code. And we went through all the ticket, the, the issues that we had, and we tagged them or labeled them with the particular um, thing that we were working on uh, or the, the requirement that we were working on. Now, we didn't actually use labels for this because that would have gotten out of hand. What we did was, this was largely copy-paste from that 80-page mock-up document. And uh, we broke that down, and then we went in and put in those links, right? And so this is the one that goes back. So the fact that there's a link to this anchor is what then makes it feasible for us to link back into the GitLab issues that have that, that reference, that, um, that particular requirement. So this is the first thing we did in order for us to be able to easily go back and forth between what are the features we're working on and building, and how does that fit into the broader picture of the requirements overall. Once we were able to uh, sit down with the, um, the, the evaluator, we, start, we started looking through this and saying, well, how can we connect this with what we had in, um, uh, in, the, uh, in our system, right? So we have this, it's linked to the issues, the issues are getting closed, but it doesn't yet illustrate that the behavior is in the system itself. And we didn't particularly want to spend a week sitting down with them, going through each of these things and showing them. So what we started to do was we started to tag our tests with the, requirement, uh, the requirements. So you'll see in the upper right hand, this is maybe a little small. Here, let me, let me zoom in on this. Hang on a second. So you'll see that this particular feature actually satisfies a bunch of the requirements that we have. And so um, by tagging it this way, we were able to show this feature does this and this and this and this and this as far as these requirements go. And this all links back through that mock-up document and how that fit together. Now, what we did have at that point was, is this particular feature implemented yet, right? Or for this particular, not feature, this, is this particular requirement or is this particular specification in, in there? And so that's where this came in. So what we did was we put together some, some scripts um, that would essentially run Bayhat against each one of these tags, right? So with Bayhat, when you have these tags that we were just looking at there, what, what it will do is you can say, just run me the tags for BR031, right? So any of your tests that are tagged with that will get run, and only those that have those uh, will get run. And so what we did was we automated the process of scanning through all of these requirements tags and running the entire test suite against each one individually. And so for each requirement, we then had all of the tests that satisfied that, that component. So this is all the behavior that we figured actually satisfied that particular requirement. Now, the problem with big requirements is that some things are very big and some things are very small. And so in some cases, we had a lot of behavior. Uh, they might have one line on, they had one requirement for search, right? But they had a lot of expectations of what was gonna come out of search. Right? And so we ended up having some really extensive uh, tests around some of that. But essentially, this is what we would do. We would go through and we would build out this report. Now, initially, I was thinking we would do this as part of our CI build, um, but we backed off of that because it took about two and a half hours every time we would run this because it had to re-bootstrap Bayhat for every one of about 450 requirements. And so this would be something that I would just, at the end of the day, I would run it, it would generate the page, and then I would just commit that page and we, we would go from there. What this also then allowed us to do was to go through and see some of the ones that didn't yet have any tests associated with it. And we would then, as we were closing in on the, on the production date, where we had done all the high priority things, we were able to go through and say, oh, uh, you know, we haven't got this part about privacy laws, so I think we need a footer page with privacy, a privacy policy, right? And we went, That's, this is just an example. We actually had that from long before. But it allowed us to identify the things that where there were gaps, and a lot of the gaps were just that we hadn't tagged a particular test for this. We had behavior that satisfied it, but we hadn't made the, the link between them, 
And then we also came across, uh, once we had filtered through all of those, we realized that there's a bunch of requirements that were left that just weren't functional, that we couldn't test, such as um, it will be secure. The system will be secure. Now, how do you test that it's going to be secure? You can do a ton of like you know penetration testing and stuff like that, but that was not part of the scope of what we were talking about here. So what we did was we created a platform benefits page that basically, um, again, copy pasting from the original proposal where we were addressing these things, and we just describe how between uh, Drupal and Agir and our update process and the flexibility and speed with which we could do it uh, would satisfy these requirements. And so there was a this was just a narrative component to it when there wasn't a technical um, uh, a technical test we could do uh, for some of these things. Turns out it wasn't all that much that was left over uh, in those components. And then there were a few things where, um, and I, I don't have an example of it right here, but there were some that were just like not, not relevant at all right, to us. It was things like um, how uh, some of these agencies who were already running their COPs um, could move their stuff from this, their COP into this other one. But that was like a policy level thing. It wasn't something that we were able to, to, to do much with. And so some of those are just flagged as um, this is you know, out of scope, basically. Um, and so that's basically how Hugo fit into this. And then the way that we automated the, um, the generation of these, project, these things, as well as um, automating a lot of the development processes, was using GNU Make. Now, if you're not familiar with GNU Make, uh, generally, this is used for compiling things like the Linux kernel, right? Now, you'll, you'll use GCC and stuff to actually do the compiling. But GNU Make sort of says, OK, well, I need to compile these libraries before I compile this other, this other thing, um, this executable or whatever. So it's a dependency manager, actually, uh, which is really nifty. Um, and it doesn't have to be something that's compiling. In this case, a lot of it was using it to compile the pages that we were generating. Um, but it also allowed us to basically, anytime we had a process that had more than a couple of lines, where it might be like Lando dis destroy or whatever and Lando build, like if we want to just rebuild everything, we would just make a, create a make target for it. Now, make is essentially, um, it's essentially bash on steroids. Okay, it's got bash with dependencies in it. So this is an example of the piece where we would um, build out that, that requirements uh, page. And what we had done was we had split them into, or actually they were delivered to us in different pillars. Okay, so just different sort of broad categories in which the requirements would fit. And so we split those out into uh, separate pages with all of them in place. And uh, we had a little bash script that we would call that would, um, iterate through it and run uh, in one case, let's see, I think it's in here. No, it's actually this requirements.sh actually just calls Lando Bayhat tag, okay? So it would reach into Lando, run Bayhat inside of Lando with that tag, and it would just iterate over that to generate all of those, those, those pages. And then this would concatenate all of that um, into uh, these sections, and then it would build that into a single page that had the entire report. And so what essentially GNU make allows is for us to say make rex, so this uh, on page uh, line eight here, for example, this uh, REQS, that's for requirements. And it would basically just, what, what this does is it says, in order to make rex, I need to do umbrella, pillar form one, pillar form two, et cetera, et cetera, okay? And that's just how you define dependencies. And so instead of saying, was the umbrella one already built, GNU make handles that for us. So if it goes part of the way through and then it fails, um, you can just rerun it and it'll identify what's already been done properly and uh, it'll just pick up where you left off. Those are things that are really hard to do in Bash if you're doing it like manually, right? So GNU make was a great um, help in doing this and um, I've been using it for a lot of other stuff like whenever I want to install Composer locally at a particular version, I just have like a make Composer um, I use a lot of Ansible and DevOps stuff, so I, I do make Ansible, so I have a particular version of Ansible that I want for that particular project. So anybody that's with me is also running on that version. Um, and GNU Make is a great tool for that, and I put a bunch of that stuff into a little project I call DrumKit that um, I can then sub-module into whatever project I'm working on, and I just get all of these tools in place instead of having a bunch of snippets in like gists or whatever 
Um, this is how I kind of share these things and having a team now that's building out this kind of capability, uh, we, we kind of put everything into that and share that across our projects and iterate on it. Um, and it is available on, uh, on GitLab. Um, the, we just transitioned from GitHub pages to GitLab and I haven't put together the GitLab pages, but that should be up soon. And that's at uh, drumk.it, so drumk. Um, and that's basically the tools that we used to, uh, to get through all of this stuff. And I think that's the end of the presentation. Yeah, so here's how you can contact us. Um, are there any questions, comments, things that you'd like to see a little bit more about? I know I covered a lot of ground. Did you find you had to write a lot of the, in, in a, you had the PDD? I've worked with that a little bit and was frustrated at how much actually coding you need to do behind the scenes to get the the uh, No, uh, the reason being that there's a Drupal extension for it that is fairly well tuned for Drupal 8, so like the, it'll look for the, like the title field or the label field or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so the vast majority of it uh, is just out of the box. And that depends on Mink, which is the, the web framework that provides things like when I am on X page, right? Okay. Um, so. Um, is, is the Drupal 8 uh, a big improvement over 7? I've already used the version 7. Uh, Drupal 8 is an improvement over 7 significantly anyway, just with being consistent about things like that. I found with Drupal 7 I had to do a lot of like X query stuff to target a particular class, right? And then that becomes very brittle because if you change the implementation, now your tests are breaking because you've changed the class structure slightly or whatever, right? Um, so. Drupal 8 itself is much more consistent about how it does that. Uh, I think Twig has a lot to do with that as well, and just the structure of um, how the how the theming layer has has progressed as well. Um, so yeah, we didn't find. I mean, I can take a look. I don't know um, anything that we did do would be in here. So bear with me for a second. I'll take a quick look. Uh, so under features, it would be under Bootstrap. So we did do some stuff with email context because we wanted to make sure that if you subscribe to something and somebody updated a uh, comment that you would get your email notification and stuff. So we have some stuff like that. But generally, we do have some. Uh, let's see, this is illegible. Did you actually test receiving, sending and receiving an email? Or? Yes, uh, and for that we used, I cannot for some reason resize this, sorry. Uh, Anyway, we can look at it a little more if you want offline. But um, we use MailHog, which, uh, right, it's just, it, it'll just take all the mail, like I think it listens on whatever the port is, I don't remember offhand. Um, and it just sucks everything in and provides you a little like uh, Gmail-like interface. And so you can, you know, it'll send your send the email, you'll be able to see it in another tab. And that's how we did it. And then, so we needed to write some they had to check that, for example, the title of the email was correct. Like, so we, there's a mail hog extension that we used that then provided some of that, uh, those tools. And so we added a couple things that were like, we want to make sure that it, it, has, it has this pattern um, and that the content has certain things and that the links work and stuff like that. So we, we extended it a little bit to make sure that we were, um, anytime we ran across a bug, essentially, we would try to write a test for it and then see that it failed and then fix it, see that it worked, and go from there. Any other questions? I kept going a little bit long, so uh, I meant to go through that faster and leave more time for questions, but I guess it worked out. So there you go. Thank you very much. Um, have a great rest of uh, Drupal camp. Or Drupal